So what is up today, guys? Today we're gonna to be talking about underwriting, what it is, how to do it for property, and uh, why is it so important? So let's get to it. So what is underwriting? Underwriting is the process of seeing if the investment that you're looking to put your money into or having the investors put their money into is a good investment based on the type of risk profile that it can give you and the type of return it's gonna give you for that, right? So you can have stuff that might be extremely risky and give you, let's say, you know, 7% return. In which case you're thinking, I might as well just put it in the stock market, I'm gonna get more money, so why would it take on such a huge amount of risk just to get seven or eight percent? On the other hand, it might be next to no risk at all and maybe you know half a percent return. This is sort of like what the banks do. With the banks, you're seeing a very small return for having your money securely put there so you're not holding it in cash in your house or you know at a safe which may be broken into may be stolen and that's where the risk and return balance come into play so for example when banks lend out money right they lend out money based on our credit history how well we pay back debt so when we end up getting a mortgage right they're seeing um can this person pay off their debt how fast can they pay it off? Are they gonna pay it off too soon where if we put out so much money, we're not even gonna get any interest on our money back. We might as, well just, might as well just be giving it out to somebody else that's gonna take five, 10, 15, 20 years to pay it off. Um, is the property valued correctly? Is the area in a flood zone or, or are they sitting on top of a volcano? Right. It depends on a lot of different factors, um, and but the most important factor is how much money you're going to be making, so that you can actually pay off this debt, and how much, uh, and how good you are at paying off debt. Like how well are your habits? Just like a diet plan, if you aren't good at following it, you're probably not going to become a bodybuilder in the next six months. Right. So, it depends really heavily on how well you've been paying off your debt and how much money you make. So when you look at investment properties, a lot of the times the banks look at the DSCR ratio, the debt service coverage ratio. And what that pretty much means is, is how much money am I making to cover the debt, right? So for your NOI, your net operating income, that's pretty much all of your revenue minus all of your expenses. How much am I gonna be left with at the end of the month? Now out of that monthly amount, how much money do I have so that I can pay off my debt? Now, let's say you're making $20,000 a month off of your revenue and you have $10,000 in expenses. So you're left with $10,000 at the end of the month. This is uh, considered your net operating income. And it turns out, let's say, you know, the bank gave you a great deal and your mortgage payments are, uh, you know, $5,000. Right now, you've got a ratio of two. For every $2, $1 goes to your mortgage. Right. And it's a great ratio to have. Usually the banks are looking at anywhere between 1.15 to 1.45, depending on the asset, location, uh, your history. So they're gonna end up changing the ratios depending on those sorts of parameters. But if you have a 2.0 for your DSCR, you're gonna have no problem getting the property financed by the bank. Because they know, you know, even if you even if things get rough and let's say you have a few people that are vacant for a month or so. You still, you still theoretically should have enough in your reserve account to pay for stuff like that. And even though you might not have a reserve account because you've got so much money, you've already made off of this, hopefully you're being responsible with it. Um, you can still use that excess fund to pay off for any sort of vacant months. And that's sort of the thing where it comes to um, when you end up underwriting something, you're pretty much taking on the risk of seeing, you're acting like the bank. You know, is this investment going to be a good investment and what's the chances of it defaulting, right? So now that brings me to, you know, why do we need underwriting? Underwriting is pretty much there because we're evaluating risk, right? If I end up going into a project and I don't know how much risk is involved in it and it's showing me a 5% return, another project showing me a 5% return and I don't know which project to choose, how am I gonna differentiate it? Well, I'm gonna differentiate it based off of the values associated behind the project. Right now, is this project, um, are these projects going to individually return me the actual 5% they say they are, or 
is the are these projects because there's so much of a variance in how they make their month to month cash flow or year to year or year to year cash flow is that going to impact the return stated on paper right and what are the chances of that so when you end up looking into why you should do an underwriting it's just for a peace of mind so that you don't lose your money you don't lose your investors money and obviously that's really important so you want to go through at least the bare minimum of underwriting so you want to look at a few different parameters and obviously when you end up having your own deal or you end up going into something a little bit more detailed then you want to go through the extensive list of parameters and the extensive list of scenarios that you can that can potentially happen right so let's get started so when you're looking at the most simple bare bones underwriting you can possibly do for an investment you're looking at four things the first cash flow obviously so even if uh, the investments you're say you're picking between two or three different investments right um, you want to check to see which one has the highest cash flow even if they all might have seven percent annualized returns you're trying to see how much money is actually coming in because the more cash flow you have the more cushion you have just in case something goes wrong and also if something's returning you a hundred thousand dollars per month it's giving you say for revenue right and that return still coming in at seven percent annualized and you're comparing that to another property that's giving you fifty thousand dollars a month that's also coming at seven percent return annualized which one are you actually better off taking right and you actually have more of a leeway depending on if expenses are inflated or not to actually reduce those expenses and end up having more net cash flow at the end of the month so you always want to have more cash flow coming in if you're looking between different investments you know depending on how much risk they have Right, so the more cash flow is always the one you're going to select simply because if there was something that went wrong or if there was some sort of change in debt service ratios or if there was a change in um, your interest rates or anything like that you at least have the money to sort of save you right if you don't have enough and you're just on the edge it's going to end up becoming a problem because now that a small parameter might have changed in your uh, investment analysis the investment might not be so great. Your annualized, re your annualized return was actually gonna drop by a lot. So it might drop by one, two, three, four percent. And if you can't get the returns that your investors are looking for, you can have people that wanna cash out. Right? And that isn't good for business. So number two, you wanna look into cap rates. Right? Looking into cap rates isn't always the best thing to judge your investment off of simply because there's so many other factors involved in the property or the, the asset itself. So what you want to do is you want to look at uh, cap rates in conjunction with the other three parameters that we've got set for the simple, for the simple analysis. So with the cap rates, you can always look at NOI over asset value just to see how much you're making. But then again, you know, cap rates can increase and decrease depending on um, competition in the market, depending on the asset itself. Right? If, it's, if there's something special about it, it can increase that. Usually it's comparable, just like you end up seeing in any neighborhood. If you have a detached four bedroom, you know, two story house, everything's selling for 1.2 million, you'd eventually compare it to fairly the same thing in the rest of the market. But obviously if that one detached house has, you know, perfect insulation, has a shingle roof, has um, an in-ground pool, and much more in terms of value add aspects, then you're going to see that that property even though on the surface it might look the same for the house there's still other aspects of it that end up increasing the value a lot further right so just like that you're looking at cap rates and saying you know what am i going to be comparing a four cap five cap six cap is that going to be good enough investment you have to look to see all the other metrics behind it but the thing is with cap rates is that they work in two ways right either if you have a high cap rate you're making a lot of money but your resale value isn't going to be so great because now what you're doing is to get your uh, future sale value you're going to use you know if you want to use your noi your projected noi whatever it is you use that divided by the cap rate and you're going to get your future sale value right now if your cap rate is really high say eight nine ten percent your sale value isn't going to be as high as say if it was five six seven percent right because it works inversely but on the other end if you have lower cap rates now you might be buying in an expensive neighborhood but the asset might be a really really good asset right so it works in different ways but you just need to figure out what you're looking for in the asset the next thing number three you want to look at is the ltv ratio the loan to value so with the loan to value usually for investments you're trying to sit anywhere between 
25 to 35 percent even up to 50 percent depending on how much cash it actually needs what you're projecting for the next two to three years if you think there's going to be a little contraction a slump or you need the money there added as an extra cushion it depends on the investment analysis that you're looking at but uh, if you have it between 25 to 35 percent you can sort of figure out how much cash flow you're actually going to be making right because with that loan to value you can have different scenarios set up that if I have my loan to value set up 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, how much money am I actually going to be making? And is it worth me putting this much money into an investment or should I use that excess or that, that delta um, in another investment? It might be as a partnership, as an individual investment, but you're gonna to look to see if that makes sense or not, right? So the LTV is there to see how much money you're gonna to need to put down in order to break even on your investor side to give them what they wanna return and to see how much you want for your return. So that's where the loan to value comes into play. And for the last one, you're looking at DSCR, right? Just like the cash flow, you're looking to see the DSCR, right? So at the end of the day, you always have to pay your mortgage. You're borrowing the money after all anyway. So you want to look to see how much money am I actually going to be getting at the end in my pocket or in my fund, either if it's going to be going out for distribution or if it's going to be something I'm going to be keeping in reserve, right? So, so if I'm making $10,000 a month as NOI and I've got a $9,000 debt service, more, aka mortgage payment, I'm only going to have 10 I'm only going to have $1000 at the end of the day to you know distribute or keep in my pocket or would I rather be making $6000 a month for cash flow um, I've got a $3000 debt service and I'm going to be keeping $3000 in my pocket right so these sort of things that you want to consider do I want to have more in my pocket but with a smaller asset which may be harder to sell in the future or do I want to have less money in my pocket with a larger asset that's easier to sell and easier to scale up so these are the things you want to look at at the bare minimum when you underwrite an asset, right? Just four things, at least you can get a good image of where, where you think your asset's gonna be going and you at least you have something you can show to somebody where you know you've done like an introductory analysis of the, of the property itself. And when you do more and more of these over time, you're gonna get better at them and you're gonna end up seeing that different markets and different sub-markets end up operating in different manners, right? Because something that might be in a highly dense commercial zone, let's say, you know, downtown Toronto, downtown New York, where it, you know, the square footage might be four or $5,000 per square foot to get an industrial zoned complex there versus something in Arizona, Phoenix, Brampton, um, uh, BC might be, you know, $600, $600 per square foot to get that same unit, right? And then is my investment worth it to be seen in the city because I have easier distribution channels and I have everything coming in from port and I have everybody, majority of my customers being there or should I invest so far out that uh, I'm still gonna be getting some, most of my customers out there, but is it much cheaper? Is it a better return on my investment? Or is this something that uh, later on, if I decide to sell it, am I not even gonna get a dollar extra in appreciation, right? So these are just things you wanna consider, but when you look at stuff that's more complicated, you're looking at a bunch of other factors. So I'm gonna read them off my laptop and they're gonna pop up as like an air bubble. And uh, I don't know, hopefully you guys can catch them. So what you're gonna be looking for is you're going to look into different scenarios, right? Increased interest rates can obviously increase the debt service, which means less net cash flow in your pocket at the end of the day. Um, longer vacancy periods, which means no cash flow from certain units or the entire building itself. How is that gonna affect your um, Breaking, break even reserve amount. How much money do you need to stay alive and how long can you stay afloat without any sort of cash flow? Uh, CapEx damage, if there's like a snowstorm or a thunderstorm or that volcano that your property was sitting on actually blew up and now you've got to repair the entire thing. Do you have the funds to do that in your reserve or is it gonna count as like a year's worth of money that you were supposed to have now just gone? Insurance claims on the property can also take a toll, especially if you have somebody that you know did a slip and fall and now they're gonna sue you for half a million dollars. So is your property gonna be repoed? Do you have to come out of pocket with that? What sort of uh, avenue will you be taking in order to sort of cover those costs if they, if they arise? Fake occupancy on possession. So that pretty much means a lot of the people that were occupying the units were friends of families of the landlord, just to make it look like they were living there, just to make it look like the cash flow was strong so that the seller can sell for a higher, for a higher uh, price. And you know, a week or a day after 
you move in, you buy, and you sign off on the paperwork, these guys are gone, right? And it's gonna do it again and again and again. Unfortunately, there's nothing to uh, stop them from doing that, but that's just something you wanna be aware of. So you end up looking at their T12, the seller's T12 to see how long that certain person has actually been there, right? And if they're on a month to month or if they're on a week to week, something really, really short term, then you wanna get them on, uh, you wanna get them signed on a contract before they end up leaving, right? But if you have, you know, everybody on your payroll, everybody on the rent roll, sorry, that's uh, a month to month or a week to week, that's something that you wanna look into, that's risky. So increased insurance rates can also be a big problem in certain, uh, in certain provinces and certain states, you have much more in terms of insurance rates because the property might be in a flood zone. Uh, it might be in a highly active environment zone as well. So it might be a little risky there. That's why they end up having, you know, insurance rates of $300, $400 per door. If you're only making a thousand or $1,500 per door, that's going to take, end up taking a big chunk out of it. So either you have a really, really good insurance broker or it's going to be very expensive. Tenant damage. You should always count. You should always uh, put a budget, a small little budget aside for tenant damage. Anywhere between fifty dollars to seventy-five dollars a month for that. So not everybody's going to break something every month or every week. But at least you have a small little reserve there, just just when that one or two or three clients do end up, you know, punching a hole in the wall or breaking a stove or something like that. Rent growth rate. So you wanna look at your rent growth rate, obviously, because you're trying to project out to see in five years and six years, how much money is this actually gonna be making in cash flow month to month? And if I wanted to sell that, how would that affect my uh, resale value? Your vacancy growth rate obviously needs to be there as well. Um, your vacancy growth rate doesn't really increase a crazy amount, but you need to factor in how much of my, how many of my units might be vacant just in case um, a large employer in the city moves out to a different place just for cheaper just for cheaper rent so you want to have that put in just in case the expense growth rate obviously you need to have that just like the rental income rate if it's at market you want to put it at two percent growth per year the expense rate you can put at three percent just to be uh, safe so that your expenses are always increasing larger than your income obviously you don't want to have something crazy high like five six percent you want to keep something more realistic like three so just have that put in there um, your location, obviously, because if the location is a great location, that'll end up increasing the asset price a lot faster. So you can put appreciation rates depending on the cap rate in the area. If they're at growing at say, you know, 1.1 or 0.2 per year, you can end up having, uh, you can, depending on how you want to model, you can end up doubling that, or you can end up putting it as a percentage based, uh, appreciation. The asset type itself, the asset type itself if you were to rezone it or if you were to sort of add a different um, addition to it, how would that increase value, right? Or if you were to create renovations in it and you're trying to do like a burr, how would that add value to the property? How much cash do you need to come out of hand for the redevelopment in order to have the new, the higher income, the new higher income affect your bottom line, right? So how long will that take to do? The investment strategy itself, you wanna have the investment strategy obviously set up in your favor. So, you know, it might be a burr, might be a hold, might be a conversion, might be a wholesale, might be a short-term investment. It just depends on what you wanna do, but obviously you need that investment strategy there in place. Otherwise, you wouldn't really be purchasing the asset. The exit strategy, the exit strategy is obviously the most important thing. So when you end up purchasing an asset, usually investors hold it anywhere between three to seven years. And uh, in that timeline, you've got your your purchase price, you've got your sales price set. So you know, you know, sort of the avenue that you're gonna be taking to get there, right? So if you have no exit strategy, you obviously don't wanna be keeping your investors in there forever. Some people wanna hold the asset forever. I think it's a great idea. But if you have people that wanna get cash out, they, sorry, if you have people that wanna cash out, then you're gonna to wanna to have um, an exit strategy set for them, right? Just in case you wanna refi, cash out their ad, cash out their position, right? And then you end up just taking on the newer debt and you end up still trying to cash flow again and again and again. So depending on the type of exit strategy you have, different scenarios are gonna work for you. Individual investor metrics are also another thing. So if people have, when you end up getting into an investment, what's gonna happen is if you have a syndication, or if you have something that you want to bring to a group of investors, most of the times what's going to happen is that these guys are going to have their own sort of um, return in their mind. So they're usually using opportunity cost returns. What, what that means is if I can invest in something 
uh, and it's gonna give me you know six percent a year I want your investment to give me six percent a year or higher right they don't want to get five percent or six percent or less right so they might as well just go to the the other investment that they were considering so someone might have 10 percent 12 percent eight percent it's gonna be all over the place and you need to add those metrics into your uh, model to see if the investment can work for them or with them right if not Unfortunately, you're gonna have to, you know, either increase the return to match what they want, or you end up having to replace investors, or you end up having to come in, uh, you come in as, at a larger position yourself, right? So it just depends on who wants what, and you can sort of cater that to to the scenario that you're working with. The next one is uh, waterfall distribution. So when you look into waterfall distribution, what you're pretty much doing is you're setting up sort of uh, limiters, right? And it's gonna be something like, you know, if your IRR exceeds your 8% target, you're going to end up receiving, you know, 30% of that value, right? When it receive when it exceeds 12% of your target, you end up receiving 10% of that value. When it receives fifth when you've exceeded 15% of your IRR target, uh, you're going to receive 10%. And everything else in this distribution model goes to your investors. It might be set up in a different hierarchy where you have different levels of investors going up and uh, each person receives a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, the better the, the asset uh, performs. And that's pretty much there to keep things fair, right? So if let's say you had your IRR set at 8% and turns out it did extremely well, it's at 20%. The investors there, it's not a closed book process, right? So they're gonna see how much of a return you made. And if that distribution isn't gonna be, the excess distribution isn't gonna be there, and it's, it isn't going to be coming in their pocket, they're gonna be upset. So the waterfall is there to sort of give you a chunk as the main GP or as the main fund that's gonna be investing. And a little bit of that uh, next tier, that's what they're called, they're different tiers. The next tiered um, percentage is gonna be going towards the other investors, right? So if your goal is at eight, and you performed at 20, there might be four different tiers. And at each tier, they might get, you know, 10% of that new return or so at the higher return. 8% of the higher return, 6% of the higher return, 4% of the higher return. And uh, you use that to sort of give like a fair distribution for um, different uh, investors, but it isn't an equally, but it isn't an equal distribution. So it's not like everyone gets a quarter where everyone gets 10%. It's based off of uh, performance metrics that you have in place before you end up running this waterfall model. The other thing would be something like development returns. If you end up doing a development or a redevelopment on your property, and that model is gonna require a little bit more experience if you haven't done development before. So what that pretty much means is that if something goes wrong or the costs go up or if the timeline isn't there or if the sale price goes up and your sale costs go up um, or if the market goes down under, what do you do? So you have a bunch of different scenarios that you can fall through, uh, so you can follow through with there, right? So you've got a, quite a few things to look at when you look at the extensive model. Obviously, I'm not gonna go through it all right now because each model is separate Right? And each model is gonna have so many different metrics to look through, right? So each scenario is gonna be built towards what you're looking for. Always create the worst scenario, the most likely scenario, and an optimistic scenario, just so you have sort of a spectrum to view, right? So that's, uh, that's sort of like the tip I'd like to give there. So now you know why the underwriting process is important how to sort of do it, I guess. I'll probably go over a model soon um, in my next videos, in one of my next videos, and uh, I can take you through like a simple version of how to actually look into an investment property. And hopefully you guys can find that useful. But if you guys have any other questions or comments, feel free to like, subscribe, share, and uh, I'll try to do my best to cover that. Thank you, take care.